After being created far out at sea, our waves complete their journey by arriving at the coastline. And in this episode, we're going to explore how an arriving swell changes into what we surf at our beaches. Up to this point, we've been describing deep water waves. And that is to say, waves traveling in water depths greater than half a wave's wavelength. At this depth, the energy of the wave doesn't reach down enough to touch the ocean floor. And so the waves travel across the ocean with very little interference. As we mentioned in the previous episode, waves travel as a stack of decreasingly sized cylinders of energy from ocean surface down. As a deep water wave approaches a continental shelf and the ocean depth becomes shallower than half the wave's wavelength, these cylinders begin to rub along the ocean floor, reducing the energy within the wave through friction. To add some context, a 17 second period swell approaching continental Europe will start touching the ocean floor at a depth of around 250 meters which means waves heading to Cornwall in the UK have to drag along the seabed for 350 kilometers before arriving at the beach. Meanwhile, in southwest France and Portugal, this depth is found only 45 kilometers out to sea, and in the Canary Islands, it's just three kilometers offshore. Therefore, the same waves from the same deep water swell would likely produce very different breaking waves on each of those countries' shores. The waves not only lose energy when dragging along the ocean floor, but also speed as the friction slows the waves down. This causes waves to bend inwards towards shallower water, a process known as refraction. Refraction helps to direct or align the waves with the coastline and to potentially reach beaches that aren't directly facing the swell direction. Refraction can either concentrate the power of a wave onto a smaller area of coast or stretch the energy of the wave over a wider area. For example, where a wave reaches a shallower sandbar or reef, the parts in deeper water will continue at speed, while the part of the wave that hits the shallow water will slow over the lessening depth, pulling the edges of the wave inwards, concentrating a greater length of the wave energy onto the sandbar or reef. Refraction can also stretch the energy of a wave, like what we see on the back of islands that interrupt traveling swell. The closest side of the island meets the swell first, and the waves are led around the coast of the island, diminishing in power the further they're stretched. What you will find is a much smaller and calmer sea on the lee shore of the island. As the waves slow down during this process, the wave period remains the same, but the wavelength decreases. And as the wavelength decreases, the height of the waves increase. This process is known as shoaling, and is why the breaking waves at the shore are normally taller than the open ocean swell height. The transition to a true shallow water wave is complete at a depth equal to 1 20th of the wavelength. This means that a 10 second period wave will become a shallow water wave in 8 meters of depth, a 15 second period wave in 14 meters of depth, and a 20 second period wave in 30 meters of depth. The speed of a shallow water wave is entirely dependent on depth, not the size of the wave which means that once a group of waves with the same swell period reach a particular depth, they are all then traveling at the same speed, locking in the order and frequency of waves within a set. To calculate the shallow water wave speed, we multiply 3.13 with the square root of our depth. Therefore, once our 10 second period waves reach the eight meter depth and become shallow water waves, they're traveling at 31 kilometers per hour. A 15 second period wave in 14 meter depth will be traveling 42 kilometers per hour. And a 20 second period wave in 30 meters of depth will be traveling 61 kilometers per hour. So it's no wonder big wave boards need to be big to allow for higher paddling speed. As the wave continues to shoal, the wave height continues to increase. And the drag on the ocean floor slows the bottom of the wave down faster than the top. The higher the wave becomes, the greater the difference in speed between the bottom of the wave and the top, creating a very unstable lump of water. When the wave height to water depth ratio reaches 1 to 1.3, that's 1.3 feet of water depth for every 1 foot of wave height, the wave will collapse and break. Bigger waves will reach this point in deeper water and so break further out, and longer period waves with bigger and deeper stacks of energy will stand up much taller than shorter period shallower waves. The final few hundred meters of a wave's journey are what really impact the way a wave breaks. And although there are a lot of variables to calculate, we can apply a general rule using the slope or gradient of the beach to roughly work out how a wave may break. If the transition from deep to shallow water is abrupt, 
the wave will still be traveling fast with its deep water energy still intact. A slope with a gradient of 1 to 40 will likely produce a gentle spilling wave, while a gradient of about 1 to 10 will produce more of a pitching barrel, and a gradient steeper than 1 to 4 could produce a surging wave that doesn't really break. Waves like Chopu in Tahiti, that travel through deep water until hitting an abrupt shallow reef, break with almost unimaginable force as most of the wave's energy is released in a small, concentrated area, often breaking at a shallower depth than the typical 1 to 1.3 wave height to depth ratio. So there you have it, starting from wind into an ocean wave and then arriving at the beach. Thanks for following us on this journey and we'll see you next time.